I'm lucky enough to live in Oxford, one of the most beautiful cities in the south of England. But just occasionally, I long to head off somewhere new. Where this time? Ah, yes, Jordan. Perfect. When God created man and woman, it might just have happened a few miles from here. The Garden of Eden is said to have nestled in the Jordan River Valley, in which case it would have been the first of Jordan's many biblical sites. I'm standing in another one, Bethany beyond the Jordan, which is where St. John baptised Jesus Christ. It was also where the prophet Elijah, having parted the waters of the Jordan River, went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Archaeological and biblical evidence have come together to suggest that this is the hill where he ascended. Armenian Orthodox Christian Rustam Makhshian is assistant director of the Bethany Beyond Jordan site, and his enthusiasm left Hanan and I in little doubt of the importance of this strangely surreal place. Right here, we discovered a monastery built at a place where Elijah sent to the heaven. It includes a cave in the western part in which John dwelt and Jesus quite often visited him in this cave. John came in the spirit and strength of Elijah. So he comes to the place where Elijah sent to the heaven. He mm. dresses the same way, and he starts baptizing, talking about righteousness. People living in the villages surrounding come and ask him, are you Elijah? Are you the Messiah? What does he say? He says, I'm a crying voice in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. So here we are enjoying the both John and Jesus so. I have to admit that such claims bring out the sceptic in me, but there's no doubting Rustam's passion and profound knowledge of the evidence archaeologists have discovered to confirm its authenticity. Accounts from third century pilgrims back this up. Antonino, a pilgrim from Piacenza, who visited the site in the year 570, describes a church to be built around the cave in which John dwelt. We see now a church with the cave being an integral part of. The church basically consists of two major parts, the apse and the nave. In this case, the natural cave is the apse of the church and the nave is built in the western side. In its prime, the monastery on Elijah's Hill was an impressive place, boasting ornately decorated mosaic floors and huge baptism pools. When did people realize that this was a, an exceptional place? People knew throughout history this was an exceptional place, but between the First World War until the signature of the peace treaty between us, Jordan, and Israel, this site was a place where no civilian could arrive. We had minefields. After oh, Jordan crazy. signed the peace treaty with Israel, it took us three and a half years to demine the site. Really? And what a strange thought that something destructive like the mines may also have how to save this. We're proud, instead of having tens of thousands of mines, we have tens of thousands of pilgrims to enjoy this heritage. The site that all these thousands of pilgrims want to see above all is two kilometers away across the parched scrubland, right beside the River Jordan itself. This is the place where it's believed St. John baptized Jesus Christ. What's so unique about this spot in particular hmm. is the shape of the water between the four piers. Isn't it a cross? Uh, yes, indeed. Yes. Oh, How were baptisteries built in the Byzantine period? They were cruciform, even today. Many churches have cruciform baptisteries, but this one happens to be the only one on earth that used the River Jordan to baptize him. Let's go back in history. Jesus comes from the West. John recognizes Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Mm. And when he arrives, Jesus says, baptize me. John says, how can I baptize you? I'm not worthy to untie your shoelaces. Jesus says, let's do it to fulfill our righteousness. Eventually, John consents and baptizes Jesus. And according to the Bible, once Jesus gets out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends, and the voice of the Lord says, you my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus accompanies two of the apostles who were prepared by John. 
Andrew and Peter, who transferred Christianity from the lowest point on earth, take it to Europe, mm. all over. Mm. This is the place where Jesus baptized and Christianity started. What an extraordinary Absolutely. thought, isn't it? Absolutely. I tell people stones talk. <laughs> well, for me, they do talk. Mm. We are lucky the remains of these churches are here to tell us the big story of the big event that took place right here. Mm. Thank Shukran you so much. Shukran. Shukran. Whatever your religion, Bethany Beyond the Jordan is undoubtedly a moving and remarkable place, a testament to the power of humanity at its finest. Taking our leave of the valley, Hanan and I head upwards to the very top wow. of a holy mountain. Isn't this a spectacular view? It is amazing, absolutely amazing. And we are, I think, here uh, in Old Testament land, aren't we? Yes, this is the biblical land. This is where Moses was shown the promised land. He led the Israelites from Egypt through Sinai, Jordan, land of Moab, to Mount Nebo. Gosh, what an incredible journey. And so he got here, mm. he saw this amazing promised land before him, yes. but he didn't make it, did he? No, he was told by God that he will not make it, basically. Uh, he was getting on. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> never mind Moses. For me, you know, I'm not religious at all, and yet I find this hugely moving. I don't yes. think you can fail to be it's moved. A, it's, it's awesome. It's an awesome view, a spectacular. Beautiful. And the other thing that's really impressive is this wonderful cross. Yes, this is actually created by an Italian sculptor. It's based on the Moses' staff and the cross that Jesus was crucified on. And then is that the serpent going up round it? Yep. Beautiful. Strange, but beautiful, yeah. as many things in this world are. Mount Nebo offers more to the curious pilgrim than just an amazing, if rather hazy, view. It's also famous for its intricate Byzantine mosaics. Mosaics remain an important part of Jordanian culture. Throughout the centuries, these painstakingly created designs of coloured stones, often depicting biblical scenes, have adorned the walls of churches and palaces. Many are purely decorative works of art, but they may also serve a more educational function. In the nearby city of Madaba, the Orthodox Church of St. George features a massive 6th century mosaic map of the Holy Land, the only one of its kind in the world. We were informed by our guide, Mazen Halalsa, that this map was lost for centuries and rediscovered in 1884. Now, there's a statement which instantly begs the question, how do they just find the mosaic? By chance, the people, they want to build the house and they found, they found this mosaic. And so then did they rebuild the church yes, around the mosaic? around the mosaic. It's incredible, isn't it? Who was it who created this? They created his name, monk, his name Salmon, Salman, or Soleimanos, he's living in Madaba city, and they're helping with five students. And the map they finished after two years. They started from 563 AD in the Emperor of Justinian's period until 565 AD. Can you tell me how large would this map have been when it was complete? Yeah, the map is completed from 15 meters 15? by okay. 6 meters. So it was big, big, big yeah. thing, wasn't it? And how many pieces were there? 1,600,000 cube mosaic. Wow. That's a lot, isn't it? Yes. Madaba is known as the city of mosaics, as for 300 years during the Byzantine era, the city produced some of the finest mosaics in the world many of which survive to this day. The mosaic tradition lives on in the town thanks to the Madaba Institute for Mosaic Art and Restoration. Opened in 1992, the school offers diploma degrees to students who wish to learn the art of mosaic creation and restoration. After graduating, many of these students will go on to make works of art sold in shops across Jordan. But more importantly, students are encouraged to pursue a career in mosaic restoration so that Jordan's 400 or so historical mosaics can be preserved for future generations. Hanan and I met with the director of the school, Victor Adnan Shiawid, who showed us around the workshops where the students learn the art of making mosaics. So how do you actually begin to work on this? The first semester, we learn the students in the classroom how to deal with the mosaics, how to draw 
the shapes. So the first step in making yeah. a, a mosaic is the drawing. Yes, yes? yes. exactly. All these stones are uh, natural. There's natural. no colouring whatsoever. Yeah, no, That's no. exactly no, how they come. No, mm. this is come from our quarries here uh -huh. in Jordan uh -huh. in different colours. Different colours. Especially That's amazing. red, black, white. Could I have a look at one of the sticks? Yes. So it is just, oh, it's cold. It's very, very cold. It's just a stick of what is marble, is it? Made of limestone. This is limestone. Yeah, yeah limestone. It's beautiful. And you have the snippers, so it's just... Yes. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you, where you're snipping, but the stones aren't all entirely the same length. In, in the Byzantine period, and in the early Islamic period also, mm. there are some differences between the size of the stone. If I want to do some original copies of uh, eyes or something like that, we have to deal with one millimeter square. Oh one goodness. millimeter. <laughs> so and it, oh, it wow. is it not easy to do this because really it needs patience. Yeah, yes. I can see. Could we help? Could we do a little <laughs> tiny bit? Easy, easy peasy. If you have Promise the patience, we want if, if you can now do something, <laughs> OK. okay. <laughs> Hanan gets a quick lowdown from a student on entry-level mosaic making. She needs to, first of all, find out which piece of stone and what colour it is, and then determines the size of the stone to cut, and then she cuts it. So this is natural glue with some water and some flour. Oh, really? Yeah. Could we have a go at placing? Mukan ta'alimina. Thank you. The first thing you need to know is that these mosaics are actually upside down. What you're seeing here is the back of the mosaic. Once every last little tessera is in place, it will be covered in cement then flipped over and washed. The flour and water paste dissolves to reveal an even, firmly secured mosaic. I could get really, really lost in this. I want to come and, come and be a mosaic maker. I think I found my calling. <laughs> Finally, Hanan tears me away from mosaic making as we have a long drive ahead of us to the very north of the country. Jordan is not a country I normally associate with winemaking, but Hanan is out to prove me wrong. Sophia, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Omar Zomoz. He's probably the most uh, pioneering person in Jordan, and he's the best winemaker in Jordan. Wow, that's quite an accolade. Thank you. Well, correction, I'm just a wine student. I'm still learning to see what uh, this land can give us as, as Jordanian great wines. Omar's father, Boulos Sumot, started the family wine business in 1954. The first vineyard was in Madaba, near the St. George Mosaic Church that Hanan and I visited earlier. Zumot Winery adopted the church's name for their wines. Now they've planted bigger vineyards up here with an impressive array of different varieties. It's a shame that we're here in spring when all we can see are bare twigs. Here we have got just huge, huge expanse mm. of vines stretching, I believe, right over to the Syrian border. The Syrian right? border, yes. yes. This is part of the Syria of the uh, Horan Plains, which was the food basket of the Roman Empire. Zumot Winery is 58 years old, young in winemaking terms. They're still experimenting with different grape varieties in a bid to discover which produces the finest biodynamic red and white wines for the St. George label. What we're doing here is that we're experimenting about 34 different noble varietals and see what are the best varietals for the Jordanian nature. That's, so, a, that's a lot. That is a lot. And that's actually, an awful we, lot. Yeah, we, we thought the uh, experiment would be easy that few years after we start planting, we'd know what works and then we focus on it and eliminate the ones that did not work. Everything worked. So we have to do <laughs> every year 34 different wines and look through the next 20 years uh, what kind of wine we will have expressing itself in a better manner. So maybe the question, what is the best wine for Jordan, will be answered by my son or grandson. Tell me a bit about your background. 
Ah, you'd stop drinking my wine then. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a chemical engineer. This is my background, so... Uh, I, I have to say, I was not expecting no, that at um, all. No, wine was my, in, in my blood. My father was a vintner since 1954. And since I was four years old, he always told me, this land can produce the best wine in the world. And, you know, you, I was brainwashed to believe in this. <laughs> and we have the big difference in temperature between day and night. We have the complexity of the soil. We have the basalt, the limestone. We don't miss the sun. We have 365 days of sun. When people come here to the vineyard and they ask me, where's your winery? I just have a bunch of soil and tell them, this is my wine. This is where the <laughs> wine is made. A good wine, it's a, it's a complex wine where all the elements of the soil are in a bunch of grape. And that's what you get. All this talk has worked up a fine thirst. Enough chit-chat, it must be time to sample the wines themselves. Slap bang in the centre of the vines is Omar's summer house. And that's where we're heading. So what have we got here? We have a Chardonnay 2009, a barrel fermented uh, uh, biodynamic uh, white, mm -hmm. and a Cabernet Sauvignon, which was our pride because it won a gold medal in Mondo's Vini in Germany. So let's start with the Chardonnay. Uh, this wine was fermented in the barrel and then racked a few months later. It mm. stayed on the leaves for about 14 months. Oh, it smells glorious. Yeah, nice bouquet of vanilla, dried apricot. Mm. Oh, that is nice. I mean, it's almost chewy, isn't it? It's a really substantial, rich... Just like, uh, you know, the first kiss you just don't forget easily. Um, <laughs> I love that description. <laughs> um, I don't like white wine, but this is an exception to the rule. It is glorious, isn't it? Could we taste the next one? Of course. Mm. <laughs> this wine is more of a storyteller, and now you'll understand what I'm talking about that. Okay. Mm. This is lovely looking. I love the colour. Wow. Colour and alcohol here is no problem. We don't miss the sun, so our wines are always very powerful, very concentrated in colour and aroma. So, uh, gosh, this is... Such a great scent. I mean, there's when all I, kinds of flavours in there, yeah, aren't there? You have mm. sherry, blackberry, mm. uh, chocolate. So smooth. Wow. It's got all those big, big flavours in it. It's got the sort of the leather and cinnamon. It's wonderful. And a lot of tannin. The nutmeg, yeah. This is, as I told you, is a storyteller. This wine you cannot mm. taste in five minutes. You have to, you know, take it mm. through okay. an evening. And it will g give you a chapter after a chapter. What would you eat with this? Mm. A nice steak would go very well with this. I can see that. It is an incredible wine. Thank you. You must be so proud this of it. This one made me very proud, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Cheers. It's Cheers. a huge winner. Thank, Thank you. Exactly. So Suitably invigorated, Hanan and I decide to take over Omar's kitchen to make a great Middle Eastern favourite. Sophie, we're going to be making warak inab tonight. Okay, translate. <laughs> Warak anab means stuffed vine leaves. This is the vegetarian variety that we're making tonight, and since we're Zomot's vineyards, this is the most suitable dish to make. So what goes into so, the filling? Tomatoes, of course. We can't do without any tomatoes. Obviously. Right. Then come the onions, mm -hmm. about this much. So everything very finely chopped. Very much indeed. And what's underneath? Egyptian rice. Why do you use that particular kind of rice? It's short grain rice and it tastes better. Oh, OK, that's fair enough. That's a very good reason. So what else goes in? Parsley. OK. That's a lot of parsley. Then a cup of mint. You do like herbs a lot mm. here, don't you? And then half a cup of fresh lemon squeezed. And really, a bit of uh, allspice. Mm -hmm. oh, allspice? Mm. A little bit of salt and... Oh, you're, do you want my garlic? You ready? You ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's for you. Thank you. About a tablespoon. We mm -hmm. like our garlic. Can't live without garlic. Have a cup of olive oil. Then you just mash it, mix it all together. That's the filling done. Now it's time to soften the vine leaves by blanching them for a few seconds in scalding hot water and then refreshing them in ice cold water to prevent overcooking. And you can do them in batches, a few of these into, into the cold water. 
Hanan leaves me to finish blanching the vine leaves and begins to stuff and roll the little parcels. You put about a tablespoon's worth of filling in the vine leaf. Not too much because the rice is going to grow when it gets cooked. Of course, it's going to swell, isn't it, yep. in the pan? So you can, you, can, you can start by rolling it from either side. You see, I, I've put a little bit too much in here, so... I guess it depends also on the size of your, of your vine leaves. Yes. I mean, some are bigger than others. Yeah. As Hanan patiently stuffs the vine leaves, I slice a few potatoes. These will be spread over the base of the pan to prevent the stuffed vine leaves from burning as they cook. So I just cover the base with, with potato, yeah? Yes, please. What about the potato? If, if it's here just purely to prevent scorching of the, um, the stuffed vine leaves, uh -huh. You just throw it out of the air. Oh no no, that's very tasty potato. Okay, that's enough. That's Is okay. Covered? That's right, there's a few holes here. It's no, no, no. okay. Okie dokie. Is this all right? That looks just great. Okay, the way you place them in the pan is quite important because you don't want them opening up. So you place the join, if you like, downwards. And you can start with the edge. Okay. It's going to take an awful lot to fill this up, isn't it? Yes. I need a bit of help. Shall I make some? Yes! It's my turn to have a go. Guided by Hanan, I put a tablespoon of the filling onto the vine leaf and gently fold over the edges and roll tightly. It takes a little while, but eventually we've rolled enough of our small bundles to cover the potato slices. So, is that enough? We've got them tightly packed, look at that! Nothing's going to move now. Good. OK, so now what we have to do is add some water, mm -hmm. enough to cover it. So we need a bit more lemon juice. Then what you do is you add pomegranate molasses. Usually this is about a teaspoon. It's a good measure. We're going to try and find a way of stopping things from moving, so we're going to put a plate. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that just sort of anchors them in place. Yes. Fantastic. After an hour on a low heat, the stuffed vine leaves are ready. They look lovely and the smell, wow. It's, ooh, it's all lemony. OK. So, really, it's about transforming them from here into here. Wow, it's a slow process, this, yes. one by one. And now, do you usually eat these warm, cold? Yeah. Well, it's up to you. You can have them both ways. And usually, they're accompanied with yogurt. And the potatoes at the bottom, mm -hmm. we normally fight for them. <laughs> Oh, they are lovely. Yeah. I can see why you fight for them. They're gorgeous, all lemony, and it's got a taste of the pomegranate molasses and the herbs. Mmm, that is so good. So can we taste this? Yes. Mmm. Mm. That is good. Mm. That is so good. It's really juicy, and I love all the lemony, lemony flavors, flavors and the pomegranate molasses mm. and the soft rice. Mm. It's wonderful. Sasuke. Sasuke.